Hello to everybody who made it. Um, I want to our first webinar on business environment reform for micro and small enterprise development. Um, it's a webinar held by the Business Environment Working Group of the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development. And before taking a deep dive into the topic and handing over to our main speaker, um, Simon White, who is joining us from Australia late at night, um, I would kindly like to thank Jim Tanburn and his, his, Lucrecia from the DCD Secretariat for assisting us to set up um, this webinar and to help us with the technical items. We have you all, um, we ask you to kindly keep your microphones shut so that we don't have too many background noises. Um, but we um, and to use mainly the chat function um, if you have questions during the presentations um, or also in the discussion later on. We will start with a short um, introduction um, and then we would like to um, show you the new video that the working group produced um, just before the summer as an introduction to business environment reform. Um, uh, which can be freely used and accessed on the DCD webpage for training purposes. After that, we will move to the main presentation and hopefully have a lively discussion at the end on the findings or con um, agreements or controversy um, arguments. We encourage you to ask your questions and share your experience there. Given um, the fair number of participants, uh, we kindly ask you again to shut uh, to use the chat function and we will closely monitor your questions and either read them out or ask you individually to unmute your microphone. Um, so Jim, um, we could start with the introductory video now. So from the video, you could see that the working group has jointly developed guidance on how donors can go about business advising on business or supporting business environment reform with concrete definitions, key principles, as well as some issues that where no consensus was found when um, writing the guidance or not enough evidence was there. Since then, various connected issues have been analyzed in technical reports published in annexes, um, which was also mentioned in, um, in the video, for example, on the relation of business environment reform with gender, on how to um, do business environment reform, looking at different industry sectors or um, reforming the business environment, not only at a national, but also at a local or regional level, its relation with quality infrastructure or industrial policy. Last year we worked on, um, in, in particular, on public procurement for SMEs. And as a short outlook before jumping into our topic for this current work year of the DCD, which is from June uh, 2018 till June 2019, we concentrate our efforts on business environment reform and investment promotion. We started working on a report already last year and by the end of the year, the final report should be ready. And um, we just started um, drafting the terms and will contract shortly a consultant that will look um, in more detail into the link between business environment reform and structural transformation. And um, we also, decided in the area of digitalization and um, artificial intelligence to have a closer look at the use of new technologies in regulatory delivery. Um, in addition, we plan a couple of uh, further webinars um, and the next one most likely in October will be on BR and the informal economy. 
All that said, I would like now to hand over to Simon White, a consultant who is working on business environment reform as well as on SME development since many, many years and for a wide range of donors. He also supports the business environment working group at Secretary since many years. And um, Simon, the floor is yours now. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to have the opportunity to um, uh, share the um, work that the donor committee has been doing over the last few months or since the beginning of this year um, on business environments for micro and small enterprises. This is um, a report that is almost complete. It's, um, uh, it's, uh, stages are, it's been through a few drafts. Um, and we thought, because of this webinar uh, at this stage, we thought we would open it up a bit longer um, and invite you, if you have comments, uh, either comments you want to share during the discussion today, or if you'd like to email um, us any comments you have on the draft report uh, by the end of the month, then we can uh, consider those comments as we look at um, uh, making the final revisions before publication. So. Better business environments for micro and small enterprises. Micro and small enterprises have been a consistent issue for the DCED for, uh, probably since it started. For those of you who have a long memory, uh, um, the, the donor committee actually began with the, with the title Small Enterprises. Um, it was the Small Enterprise Donor Committee or something like this uh, way back. And um, at some stage there was, a, there was a discussion as to whether or not the name should change and it did because it was considered that the issue of focusing on small uh, was somewhat, somewhat problematic. What's interesting is that the issue of the, the importance of micro and small enterprises continue so that whilst we might focus a lot on private sector development, there's still a persistent interest in um, what's happening at the lower side spectrum uh, of the enterprise categories. And so that's really been one of the uh, factors that have led to this study. This study broadly had, had three broad objectives. The first was to review the literature on business environment reform and its impact on micro and small enterprises with a focus on developing economies. The second was to, to uh, consult with agencies, um, particularly members of the, of the donor committee, to get a sense of how they are approaching this work and to understand the extent that they focus on enterprise size at all, or formality issues, and how they go about doing that. And then if possible to really come up with a kind of typology or in the original donor guidance that the video refers to and Stephanie referred to, we talk about functional areas to so try and understand how what functional areas have been particularly focused on when dealing with this. Um, the methodology was fairly simple. We reviewed literature, both academic and published, uh, as well as program documents uh, of agencies and other resource documents. And then we conducted a survey of members and had uh, uh, 13 agencies actually reply and respond in, in fairly good detail uh, to a series of questions. And we followed up with subsequent discussions at, at, uh, with various agencies. Of course, the issue of what is a micro and small enterprise varies. Um, Different agencies have different definitions as to how they approach this, what they might think of it. But more importantly, um, different countries define this in different ways. And I think it's generally agreed that countries will set their own definition for what a, a, an enterprise is, what the size of an enterprise is based upon their national, social and economic conditions. So it's very hard to have a one size fits all or one definition fits, fits all to this. Um, so wherever possible in the report, We've tried to um, identify the size category that's been referred to. Where that wasn't possible or where we use general uh, definitions, we typically refer on the world, to the World Bank Enterprise Survey definition, uh, which as you can see on the slide suggests that micro is fewer than five, small is five to 19, medium 20 to 99, and large is 100 or more. I think it's important to understand why uh, there, what the arguments are for supporting micro and small enterprises specifically. And I think what we found is generally there are two broad categories of arguments. The first is that these size enterprises are important because of the contribution that they make uh, overall. Now, this is somewhat contested. There is evidence, I think, that goes both ways on this. Uh, and in the report, we certainly cite different um, uh, evidence take, which comes to different conclusions. Um, but I think on the whole, there's a general understanding that um, uh, 
the contribution that uh, micro and small enterprises make collectively to net job creation, value addition, and growth, whilst it varies from study to study, it is somewhat significant. Um, I think what's, what's interesting in the contested views is that there are more important things than just size. So we often hear about gazelles, high growth firms, for example, which are you know, obviously not enterprise, all enterprises of a certain size. There are other features and other characteristics uh, that define or affect that contribution that those enterprises make to a national economy. The second case or argument for supporting or paying attention to micro and small enterprises is about their vulnerability. Um, the vulnerability comes from two areas. The first is that they, they are largely they are smaller than larger enterprises, of course, meaning they have less resources, um, uh, they, less uh, less fat, <laughs> less management structure, few flatter management structures, less resources to draw on, um, and that affects their their ability within um, uh, the market and within a governance system. And there are many studies that I think, uh, certainly those that are cited in the report, that show that smaller enterprises disproportionately are more vulnerable to a poor business environment than larger enterprises. So the effects of a poor business environment is felt more by smaller enterprises than by larger ones. So these are two reasons broadly that have been used to sort of justify why we should um, focus on this sector. When we try to map or understand agencies and their approach to this sector. Uh, we firstly found, of course, a significant variety of, of approaches and, and um, perspectives or lenses that agencies would use to approach this sector. Most agencies, uh, however, really do suggest that their, their interest is on private sector development more broadly, uh, that the, the focus is, is what are enterprises of all sizes and to act, trying to encourage the growth of enterprises and further investment into the private sector, regardless of size. Um, however, we, we, there are agencies that do have um, dedicated or focused programs that do specifically uh, uh, identify the micro and small enterprise sectors and target it in different ways. Across the board, agencies, um, most agencies would say, though, that they, their primary focus for prim private sector development is around economic growth and transformation. And if their diagnosis at a country level shows that there is a particular blockage or concern uh, uh, or constraint faced by micro and small enterprises, then they would focus on that. But that would really be based on, upon uh, their country assessment and what their understanding of the growth and transformation dynamics might be. So the report identified or, or focuses on four broad themes uh, within the issue of micro and small enterprises. Uh, these four uh, begins with formalization of informal firms, recognizing, of course, that many micro and small enterprises in developing economies are typically in, uh, informal to various degrees. Obviously, there's not necessarily a black or white situation, uh, but informality amongst the sector is very high. And so there are reforms that, that programs and agencies that support reforms to encourage the formalization of informal firms. The second is around the regulatory, uh, legal regulatory preferences and exclusions. That is where the whole um, weight, if you like, or the, the full compliance requirements of the legal and regulatory framework um, is reduced for smaller enterprises uh, or whether there's some degree of preference provided to this group. The third area we look at in the report is around access to finance uh, and particularly recognizing that micro and small enterprises as a, as a group typically face troubles in accessing uh, the finance they require uh, to, to become more competitive or to expand. Um, so again, while there might be um, business environment reforms dealing with financial sector reform, uh, there are many programs that within that broad approach do start to focus on the issues for, for faced by micro and small enterprises, uh, whether it's because they don't have the collateral, the rate costs of interest uh, are too high, uh, or whatever it might be. This group is particularly, particularly challenged by poor financial markets. And finally, the, the issue of women-owned and managed enterprises. Uh, again, whilst there's some varia variation from country to country, um, in many countries you see that there are predominantly more women-owned enterprises in the micro and small enterprise sector compared to men. Um, and that's for a whole variety of uh, 
uh, gender issues around the social uh, context in many countries. Uh, but for that reason, it often means that agencies uh, are very keen to, to encourage women-owned enterprises and therefore to focus uh, on the issues of economic empowerment for women in the micro and enterprise sector. So in the remaining slides, I'm going to um, talk more about the first two themes around formalization and then the, the issue of preferences and exclusions. Uh, that's more for the sake of time in terms of the um, presentation, but the report does deal with each four of these. In terms of formalization, we try to um, understand how uh, agencies are supporting formalization amongst micro and small enterprises and the sorts of functional areas that they, uh, they focus on. Uh, of course, the most common in this area is probably the typical because this is how for many, uh, many people or many agencies looking at the informal economy, they would typically define this as the unregistered or the unlicensed sector. And so from a business environment reform perspective, there's been a lot of support being provided in terms of how to in, uh, make registration and licensing cheaper, um, easier, more rule-based, uh, et cetera. Of course, there's a, um, a, uh, a mixture of uh, outcomes in of evidence in terms of how successful work at that level has been in terms of formalization. Uh, there's certainly been cases where uh, we've seen that registration has been improved, but that hasn't necessarily resulted in significant changes in the size of the informal economy because of a, a whole range of other drivers and issues that are affecting informality. The second area here is around taxation. And often this is very much linked with uh, registration and licensing because typically there would be a need to get a TIN number uh, or these kind of things when registering uh, a business. So uh, taxation is an area where we've seen quite a lot of work done in terms of informality. Similarly, the issue around um, agencies, there are a number of agencies that are concerned about informal workers uh, and the ways in which a uh, worker in the informal can, economy can be better protected. Uh, and so that's led to some issues of exclusions and I'll talk about that in the next slide. But we've certainly seen areas where uh, labor and labor related policies, laws and regulations have been introduced, for example, in a, a, in a scale or, or transition process where as an enterprise grows in the, the need for them to comply more and more with labor laws increases. Um, but there's a lot of work uh, that's been done by and supported by agencies in that area. Of course, the remaining points I won't go into full detail now, but we've certainly seen that uh, there are agencies that are supporting reforms around land ownership, judicial reform and uh, alternative dispute resolution financial services, uh, et cetera, voice and representation. These are all issues that to varying degrees, agencies have supported work in business environment reform in order to encourage the formalization of micro and small enterprises. The other area that I think the, that the report gives a, a, a fair bit of attention to, and I think is a particularly interesting one, is the issue of preferential treatment and exclusion. So in preferential treatment, of course, this is essentially a targeting of government resources or re and reform activity for the micro, small, and in this case, we've talked about medium enterprises as well. And here we see that there are donors that are working with uh, developing country governments that are encouraging the creation of SME policies, for example, uh, and to, to look at ways in which uh, governments can better understand the SME or micro and small enterprise sector and organize, a, create a framework in which uh, their support for the development of that sector can be better coordinated. This, of course, goes beyond just developing economies. Uh, and it's interesting to note how the Small Business Act in Europe uh, is quite a uh, significant framework for giving preference to micro and small enterprises uh, and their whole think small first. Um, what's interesting in a recent review of that uh, act and its application in European countries, uh, the think small first has often been um, interpreted as, as focusing on SMEs, small and medium enterprises, whereas in fact the original purpose of it was to deal with the more micro side, the, the, the micro and small enterprises. And here, governments are encouraged to consider the impact of all policies and laws and regulations on micro and small enterprises before they're introduced, uh, to monitor the sector, uh, and a whole range of, of uh, a set of 10 principles that are presented in the report around how governments should give preference to this group. And that includes, includes of course, uh, the issue of procurement preferences. And I know there's a big debate around um, how uh, appropriate 
procurement preferences can be, uh, both in terms of the effect on the economy wide. Uh, but certainly within this area, we're seeing uh, that many governments are introducing SME preferences in mm -hmm. order to create more market opportunities uh, for the development of that sector. The second area is around the issue of uh, legal and re regulatory exclusions, and I've touched on this very briefly already, but we see this particularly in tax and labour, where the interest is to ensure that government recognises uh, and, and um, ropes in, if you like, the micro and small enterprise sector in terms of getting them registered without necessarily overburdening them with too much compliance um, burdens. So, you know, uh, you might have, for example, the need for micro and small enterprises to obtain a TIN number and be registered, yet they may not be required to, uh, to pay tax until they get to a certain size. Or there may be the introduction of flat rate taxes, uh, which again encourage firms to be a part of the formal system and to be in that process uh, and only pay higher, um, uh, be required as they grow to pay more tax or to pay tax, any tax at all. Similarly with um, labour, we see for example a number of countries where uh, if you have less than 10 workers, you are required to, re to meet certain labour standards or certain labour requirements, but certainly not the full uh, weight of the labour legislation. Uh, only when you get above a certain threshold. And th so there are arguments to, as to whether or not that is a good thing or not, uh, but certainly we're seeing a lot of that. And some of the issues and findings that the report has around this issue of the use of exclusions and of preferential treatment, I'll talk about a little bit later as we come to the, uh, the final lessons. So just to talk for a moment about the challenges before coming up, uh, finally concluding on some of the, the, the best practices. Um, there's a number that I've listed on this slide uh, that are identified in the report about what we call the challenges that agencies face when trying to encourage reform, business environment reform that, that targets the micro and small enterprises. And I'm only going to, I put a small square next to the ones I'm going to focus on in my presentation now, but that's more for the sake of time and maybe in our discussion if there's other points you'd like to come back to, uh, I'm very happy to do that. I think the first challenge um, the first challenge is really around uh, the extent to which focusing on, on micro and small enterprises inhibits growth and transformation. There's a very strong argument that's made that um, the focus should really be on growth and transformation across the board, uh, and this is where donor activity should be given most attention. The concern is if we start focusing too much on size issues, on enterprises at the lower end, it's diverting the effects of, of, this, of this reform and thereby reducing the potential for growth and transformation. So this is a cha challenge. Can we focus or, or pay some attention to micro and small enterprises without inhibiting uh, or reducing in any way the growth and transformation prospects that a reform program uh, should or endeavours to have? The second point, um, I'll make here is around the um, supporting over simplistic or isolated reforms. Uh, again, this is one really is an argument around the need for a systemic understanding of the role of reform and suggesting that you know one-off reforms, isolated reforms that deal with one part of the system often is not enough. And we really need to find ways in which there can be a better understanding of the whole system that's affecting uh, enterprises of all sizes. Uh, and that we don't just focus, for example, on the micro and small enterprises and, and provide something around registration. Uh, it's better to understand what the whole range of issues that are affect that, the firms of different sizes uh, and then to, to consider that, that systemic approach. Limited data is another challenge. Um, certainly what we've seen in many countries is there is such a limited range of data available on the micro and small enterprise sector. It becomes very difficult uh, to know, in some cases, the number, uh, in some cases, uh, in many cases, the dynamics that, that, that they're uh, experiencing. Um, and this makes it very difficult to properly assess the effect of the, the current business environment on these firms. Uh, and of course, what role incentives or preferential treatment or exclusions or whatever it might be, um, what, what effect these have on the, on the sector. So getting good data uh, is a, a, a real challenge for agencies uh, and of course for the development partners of government agencies that are, that are doing this work uh, in the countries themselves. And finally, just to the other point I'll, I'll highlight in the, in the presentation now, 
It is the issue around um, supply chain integration, integrating micro and small enterprises into supply chain. Here we see that, of course, um, there's a lot of work going across uh, the board around the world in private sector development, which uh, focuses on supply chain or value chain development. Uh, and the challenge here is how can business environment reform uh, be integrated into that work and how to ensure there's a good com combination of opening up market opportunities through demand reform efforts, but at the same time in helping uh, micro and small enterprises become more competitive and better able to make use of those opportunities as they emerge. Uh, and so there's a real challenge for donor agencies and their partner to find the right, right combination in terms of working in these supply chains and ensuring that reform efforts do respond to both uh, demand and supply challenges. So again, I'll move on. In the questions and uh, discussions, we, there may be other form here uh, that you can discuss if you like. But I'll just move now to my last slide, which is around uh, best practices. And again, here, uh, there's a number of, of best practices that are, are raised in the report, and I'm just going to highlight a, a few of them in my, um, in my presentation for the, for the purpose of, uh, of time. The first is to give priority to a level playing field. So I think the best way of summarizing this here, I, I, I think, is to say the, the focus essentially for all business environment reform programs is to say we want to create a more enabling business environment for all firms regardless of size, and to as much as possible ensure that any um, co costs of compliance or restraints, difficulties with compliance are not based on size. Um, obviously, all regulation has some cost to business. That's uh, a feature of, 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 of regulation. We want to make that, we want to reduce those costs and reduce those risks as much as possible. And of course, we want to try and ensure that that, those, uh, that approach is somewhat size neutral. The second area is really around simplifying, reducing costs and costs and improving transparency. Again, this is a very broad sweep of a comment uh, of a practice, which is essentially saying if we can across the board for in, in the business environment achieve these, that is to make all laws and regulations as simple as possible, to reduce the compliance costs as, as, as much as possible and improve transparency, that is going to have an effect on all enterprises. And because of the research that I, that I mentioned earlier in this presentation, which shows that micro and small enterprises are particularly vulnerable, uh, it will also have a significant effect on them. So just by getting things right in the first place, uh, we would hope that the, the um, effect and the, that that would have on the micro and small enterprises uh, would be very beneficial, and that shouldn't be overlooked. The third point I'll highlight here in this best practices is around investing in objective uh, business environment assessments. I spoke earlier about the problems with getting good data, um, but the other aspect here is when we see a lot of uh, assessments that are being done, they often don't deliberately go out and try and seek data on how the business environment affects enterprises of different sizes. There are a whole range of assumptions that are typically made in most business environment assessment tools that are some that are based on uh, an understanding of an enterprise of a certain size and is not really looking for the variabilities uh, based upon um, uh, enterprise size. So the the point here is when assessments are, are being done for enterprises of all sizes, it's important to consider the size variable. Think small and aim for growth. So again, I, I think the argument here is to say just because we recognize the danger that I mentioned earlier in terms of uh, how focusing on micro and small enterprises might divert attention or divert resources away from a growth and transformation agenda, that shouldn't mean that we have to drop that agenda. That it is possible to certainly ensure and keep a strong focus on transformation and growth, uh, but at the same time recognizing how micro and small enterprises contribute to growth. Uh, so they shouldn't, they're not, it's not a binary, those things shouldn't necessarily be mutually exclusive. It should be possible to do both. And then the last point I'll just highlight here of best practices um, is the issue of representation and voice. I think, again, throughout this, um, and it's a very common uh, understanding, but I think somewhat uh, overlooked at times, 
that we know that, again, when it comes to public-private dialogue and the importance of representation, these are all important building blocks for a reform program. Yet often, we don't spend enough time on ensuring that we are getting micro and small enterprises voices represented in, the, in that dialogue. And we're not always getting uh, the perspective of these firms. Typically, it's easier to get the perspective of larger firms, uh, the, more, the better organized and so on. It takes more time, effort, transaction costs, et cetera. Uh, to better understand and hear the voice of, of smaller firms, but that's going to be important. So I think uh, at that point, I'll, I'll stop here and hand back to Stephanie, just to make the comment that um, hopefully you've already seen the hyperlink to the uh, draft report that's on the website. We can resend that if we need to. And if you do have, obviously we'll have our discussion now, but if you do have other comments to make um, uh, via email, please feel free to send them. So thanks, Stephanie, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Simon for your um, presentation of the analysis and sharing clearly some of the reform challenges and suggestions for best practices, um, which gives us a lot of food for the discussion, I'm sure. Um, so I would open the floor um, now to the participants um, in writing either in the chat box or, I mean, given that we're we could also try um, and ask, uh, speak out loud um, if you prefer. Um, I think we're not too many of us. Otherwise, I could also go ahead with one of the questions. I mean, you, you talk about the challenge of grow, um, the contribution to growth and transformation, um, as well as to go beyond um, business environment reform and to look for integrated solutions. We in German Development Corporation, we're also thinking a lot of who is who are these enterprises who contribute to growth and transformation, and there has been strong stream to, to look at uh, the so-called, what we call the Mittelstand uh, in Germany um, and, and uh, to look for concepts to promote an African Mittelstand that is um, a wider definition than what we would usually understand here in, in Europe. But for those companies who are either SMEs with some technology or with um, a high, even a, a state-of-the-art technology innovative who try to have either long-term relationships with um, are integrated in value chains or serve local, regional and or international markets. And what we find is that one of the main pillars is certainly business environment uh, reform, but to make them really grow and lead to help transformation we still need to look at things like business capacity development, so the individual support as well as um, market linkages um, to help them um, connect uh, to uh, to uh, networks, uh, the things like clusters, industrial parks, um, so a mixture of basically direct support and um, business environment reform. Yeah, um, thanks, Stephanie. I think that's right. I find that particularly interesting. I think what's clear in the survey we did with agencies is increasingly um, focusing, using the definition of criteria uh, based on size is a very blunt instrument to properly understanding uh, some of the dynamics that are going on in the private sector in, developed in various countries. And, you know, some of the ones you've already just mentioned in terms of uh, uh, other criteria, other, other Defining features uh, can be issues to do with technology, um, uh, the, their engagement in certain value chains in international markets, um, their uh, other levels of capability in terms of uh, their potential for growth. I mentioned earlier there's you know often the interest of gazelles, uh, how to identify these potentially high growth firms. Uh, and they, which are supposed to provide significant contributions to uh, to economic growth. So all of these uh, require a uh, a criteria, defining criteria that go well beyond just size. Um, and so it seems to me that that's becoming more and more important. That 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 you know size is one way of looking at this. In some cases, a very obvious way, uh, but there are many other types of characteristics. And then based upon that, of course, these agencies would. Sorry, these enterprises would face very different 
experiences within a business environment. They'd be constrained by, by different sets of things, uh, issues, uh, and so on. So again, I think it's really useful to recognize that there are a range of, of ways in which we can cut the cake, in which the, uh, we can filter out or look at certain kinds of enterprises across an economy, and these are becoming more important than simply size. Okay. We have, uh, in the meantime, we have three questions from participants, Simon. I will read them out to you. Um, from Kore, um, thanks, Simon. Very interesting. Could you elaborate on the potential trade-offs between targeting MSEs versus larger firms? Where are such trade-offs in business environment reform most likely, and how can we deal with them? For example, for some regulatory reforms might implicitly benefit larger firms more than MSEs. What are those likely to be? That's one. The other one is from Dan. Who, why do you emphasize the use of exceptions in your report, mainly for larger firms and foreign investors? Um, and what other factors are you thinking about in the good practice uh, to go beyond business reform? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, just maybe uh, to pick up on Dan's comments quickly in terms of um, the emphasis on exceptions. I, I think if, if Dan, you're asking, it's true that in some countries, large enterprises are given exceptions. I'm not too sure whether that's the point you're making, that um, we often hear about the tax write-offs or tax uh, free tax regimes that are given to, um, to larger firms uh, to encourage them to be there uh, and so on. We haven't focused on that very much at all in this report. Um, but what we uh, found particularly interesting was that rather than improve the business environment across the board uh, for, for firms in general, we see that exceptions are being made, made for micro and small enterprises because of the rationales, for example, that I gave earlier. Um, so in, in this report, we focus very much on, on the exceptions for micro and small uh, because they were seen as uh, that was seen as a particular rationale for, for giving this, this. I find it interesting that it's a, it's a case of trying to create these particular um, boundaries around certain kinds of firms that are smaller and more vulnerable and we want to encourage. And often there could be very strong political reasons for doing that uh, uh, prior to an election or these kind of things to, to show that you're helping and nurturing the sector. Um, but it's true that I think there are exceptions uh, that are sometimes given to larger firms. Uh, and yeah, there is, I think, a range of political dimensions that, that, that might be there. On the question of other factors uh, outside of business environment reform, I mean, I think I would typically see this as uh, we often talk about the, the need for how business environment reform will create new market opportunities. The intention here is to, uh, by creating increasing competitive pressures, making it uh, reducing costs and reducing business risks, we're opening up things for um, for micro and small enterprises. The trouble is then that they often are not able to pay, take up those opportunities uh, and, and not able to compete effectively in some of those markets that are being opened up through business environment reform. So the other complementary factors are often of a, a supply side nature, uh, which are really trying to now enhance the competitiveness of, of those firms, whether that's through access to finance uh, or various forms of uh, interventions that are trying to improve the management capacity and uh, uh, inputs provided to the firm to become more, more competitive. Uh, so again, I think that would vary uh, um, a lot, but beyond business environment reform, I, I think what we're seeing is these other areas uh, which are trying to help firms get the inputs they require to work and make the most of the opportunities that a, a business environment reform is supposed to create. And Corey, uh, coming to your comment about trade-offs, um, again, I'm not too sure I'm, I'm understanding you, you fully, but I think the, the, the trade-offs here I, I'm seeing is that uh, either the donor agency, you are um, just, you are investing resources into support for uh, micro and small enterprises. There, of course, and reforms around that sector, you are trading that off against reforms that you could be doing more broadly. Um, and the reason why you've been doing that is, you know, I think what we're seeing more and more is that that's based, if that's based on a diagnosis which says the, the competitiveness of the economy or the, 
the uh, potential for, for transformation in the economy, if that's uh, being felt, if that's being hindered by problems within the micro and small enterprise sector, then that's, that's where that effort, sh effort should be. Um, but the danger of that is that you're then being diverted from not focusing on the economy as a whole uh, and, the, and the broader issues. So I guess what I'm trying to, the point that the report tries to make is that in terms of that trade-off, uh, many donors seem to be increasingly cautious of that and worry that uh, by focusing on the sector where, where as I, I used the term in the presentation, being diverted or somewhat distracted by the broader issues about how to make the economy more, more function, function better as a whole. Again, maybe you can clarify if I've missed the point. There's some more questions, Simon. In the meantime, from Anastasia, um, whether you found any indicators that different agencies have used to measure milestones towards impact. And from Dragon, who thanks you also for the presentation, he asks um, whether you found good or concrete examples of successful reforms aimed at SMEs and whether these are also included in the report for concrete case studies, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, thanks, Anastasia. I think on uh, indicators of impact, I think that um, I haven't seen anything beyond the kind of work, for example, that the DC does, the DCD does with the standard in the more broader sense that we've seen in private sector development more broadly, which is around how measuring firm level um, and then aggregating that to higher higher level changes. Uh, in the economy and, and, and what, how that's being measured. But however, what I would say though is that the, it's, the, it's the diagnosis that often shapes this. So if in the, in the country diagnosis there is some degree of um, identifying the size of firms uh, in which, which require particular attention. So if the diagnosis has, has focused on um, the size variability and then based upon that, a reform program is designed, which includes definitions of sizes. Um, then that, that becomes, uh, then that, uh, we've seen those, those indicators come through. As I, as I mentioned in the presentation, I think the real concern here is that often we, we're not seeing that kind of uh, detail coming through. We're not seeing enough. And that in some cases, that's because the national data doesn't exist or it's very weak uh, in terms of um, is it really capturing the numbers uh, and the changes that are going on within a micro and small enterprise sector. Um, and at the other level, in terms of many reform programs, I think you, we sometimes see uh, references to SMEs and these kind of things. But in fact, the data is not, the, the monitoring data is really not very specific about what size firms are being measured. Um, so uh, again, it's a good point because I maybe could make that clearer uh, in, the, in the report. I've made it fairly strong in terms of the issues of government uh, monitoring of the sector, uh, but in terms of how agencies are doing this, often we don't see enough precision, if you like, in terms of a, of a size variable in, in that. And thanks, Dragon, um, for your comment uh, on successful reforms. Yeah, we, we do try and identify a few. We've, we've tried to... Um, I guess in the best practices, try to identify some of the features that are coming through. We, we haven't actually presented um, clear case studies which, have, which show how um, a country or a donor has produced particular results uh, in this, but instead focus more on the practices that have come through. Uh, and I think what we're trying to do is, is highlight the, um, the approaches and, and how, how transferable they may be to other cases. So I, we haven't done case studies, but I, I hope that the, um, the sorts of things around, for example, deliberations around what the, benefit, the pros and cons of exclusions are. Uh, we're not necessarily saying that exclusions are a good thing and that you should go in and every agency should do that. But we are saying that, for example, if you're doing that, these are the trade-offs and the things to think about. Similarly, uh, what comes up and talked about and uh, illustrated in the report is the whole issue of SME agencies. Uh, a number of countries around the world um, have uh, a ministry, an agency, a department which focus on SMEs. And again, we're not necessarily saying that's entirely a good thing, a necessary thing, um, but there are features of it that are good. The fact that it does uh, endeavour to, to focus on data collection 
uh, of the sector, that it does try and focus government resources and certainly coordinate government resources uh, toward that particular type of group. These are important things, but it's not saying in its own right that's something that always works and should be necessarily replicated. Simon, there's um, um, another question or from Dragon, a comment from Dragon who says, um, giving priority to the level playing field as policy approach sounds um, promising, but uh, is, um, as a, sounds well in theory as a fair principle, but in practice it is difficult because, for example, in New Zealand you have a 40-page labor code where one size fits all is fine, but in France with 3,000 page labor code there, you need to have size ex um, exceptions. Um, I've never seen France presented as a good case example of labor law. Hmm. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, there's Stephanie who said, who asked whether there's any finding that surprised you and uh, um, that like one a, a principle or a practice that uh, I don't not quite sure I understand the meaning and the yeah, review yeah, yeah, that I, 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 in yeah. the market did not implement yet. <laughs> I mean, one thing that surprised me, I, I think, was um, more and increasingly agencies seem to be sort of size agnostic. Um, uh, you know, I think there there is a shift. Um, that over the years that agencies, you know, for a long time, I think SME has always had a special place in, in agencies' hearts uh, in terms of what to be doing in this field and, and they're a particular case that deserves attention. But more and more in the survey results uh, uh, that we got, there's, there is this, this sense of, you know, size is much less important than many of the other factors. For example, Stephanie is the one that, such as the ones you described. Um, that more and more there are increasing um, issues that def can be used to define and, and, uh, and target firms uh, and size is, is becoming less relevant in that sense. Um, so I think that's, I, I wouldn't say it's a com complete surprise, but just in terms of a general or a, a very pervasive trend that many agencies seem to come to common agreement about that very quickly. Whereas I think 10 years ago that, that may have been uh, more difficult. Um, but just come, also coming back to Dragon's comment about the, uh, uh, the level playing field being difficult, I, I absolutely think it is. Uh, it is difficult, and I think that um, you know, in a sense of the protected labour codes and the protection of workers and, and all these kind of things, I think it's important to ensure that there's a uh, uh, a good, robust set of regulations that encourage that. Um, and how you create flexibility in that has got to be a real challenge. Um, and I don't know whether the, you know one, any one country could claim uh, to sort of have, have have a solution on that. Obviously, they're doing business uh, debates within the World Bank and, and with the ILO around um, how to measure that and whether it's about the flexibility of labour markets and, and labour laws. Um, it's, a, it's a real challenge, but I think it's a, 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 a critical one that is often overlooked. Mm. So, okay, um, did I get all the questions that were posted to the DCD Secretariat or did I forget um, anyone? Then please do unmute your mic also and just speak. Uh, there was one more from uh, Dan, good practice integrated solutions. What do you mean by framework conditions, Simon? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I, I missed that. Um, well, the, there was one good practice. Um, you, you mentioned the good practice, the integrated solutions. Um, what, what do you mean by framework conditions? Well, framework conditions is, is really the, the business environment. Um, Yes, yes, that's right. right. Sorry, it's infrastructure, a, uh, things like infrastructure, business environment, and other areas. Exactly. Sorry, it's just another um, frame, framing that I'm using for that. Uh, 
the framework conditions I would see as the, the policy, legal, regulatory, and administrative arrangements that affect the activities of business. Mm -hmm. Okay, then, well, I would like a, a last thing mentioning that John Clifford sent a document that people may find interesting on the um, Enable2, a business environment reform program in Nigeria. So you can copy the link that was just put in um, the chat box. It's also on the business environment org database that we used to have. Um, and that was initiated by our working group. Um, yes, thanks for that. Um, just a quick comment on that. Thanks for that, John. I haven't used that for this particular report, but we have actually used that um, in, in other work of the of the joint committee. But I'll revisit that for the final edits of this of this report. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And well, so. Last but not least, so thank you all for the, your valuable com comments. Don't forget that you can still comment in detail the report until the uh, 28th of September. And w well, what we would really appreciate is that if you could give, give, fill out the poll that you will be sent and that has been just posted also in the chat box. Um, well, filling out that poll, um, which is useful for us when we plan future webinars to see what are the topics, would you want uh, also external speakers, um, what would you find interesting, what would you contribute yourself, please don't hesitate to, the, the poll itself is very short, but don't hesitate to give us also, provide us additional feedback um, if you want. Um, thanks for your time, thanks for being here, and um, we will um, well include you for sure when we have set the date uh, and agenda for the next webinar. And look forward to meeting you there as well. Thank you.